Well, good morning, everyone. Um, we've heard this morning about this 30-year journey that we're about to embark on with the CDBB. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about history, because Formula One started to embark on their digital twins about 25 years ago. So it gives you an example, uh, a chance to see what can be achieved in that time. Uh, the reason, the purpose for, for looking at digital twins in the first place was fairly simple. We're trying to develop racing cars very quickly. We're trying to get the best result on the day and, and at the same time manage the risk of uh, the car not performing and also to deal with it in too short a length of time. So what digital allows you to do is to try things out quickly to be able to establish what works. And let's have a bit of context here. A Formula One car is made up of about 25,000 components, so it is, is quite complex, not as complex as a, a construction site, but there's a lot to it. But importantly, it's being changed every two weeks of the year. So in between every race, it's, it's developing probably about three to 4,000 components are being built and being installed on the car. So about five to 10% of the car changes every two weeks. And this is something that historically, if I go back beyond 25 years, used to invent stuff, you would make it, sometimes it would see the car, other times it would be wasted because you'd have new ideas that come through. So the, the idea of having a digital twin, although at the time we just called it simulation and, and analytics, was to avoid this waste of time and effort to be able to get things onto the racing car. The, the, the big digital twin for most Formula One teams now is a simulator that the driver drives. And it is kept up to date with the real car. So in the same way that we were talking this morning, the, the digital twin, the simulator, allows you to try things out quickly to see whether it has an improvement in lap time. The measurements you take on the real car allow you to validate that the digital twin is true. And this idea of the real and the virtual <coughs> operating in tandem is very important because without that validation step, you're never certain that what you are looking at is a, a reasonable prediction. Now, the, the difficulty you have in motor racing is that the, uh, the increments that you're looking at to win a race can be tenths of a second in terms of lap time. So you need a very high fidelity simulation to be able to be effective. Now, there's another lesson I can, I can teach or uh, share with you from Formula One. When we started to do simulations, we didn't have a detailed simulation of a complete racing car. It was a mixture of empirical models, of physical models, and best practice. And then over time has evolved into better and better simulations. And so one aspect of digital twins is being able to get a balance between history, which is the empirical, science, and mathematics to sort of bring the things together. And then the measurement to make sure it's true. An important part of all of this was getting data, and we had uh, telemetry, which is sending data from the, gar uh, from the cars to the garages. Uh, back in the early 90s, we were sending huge amounts of data, uh, very inefficiently. So what it meant was that you would get uh, a part of the data from the car um, when the car went past the garage and then snippets as it was out on the track. Uh, over the years that improved so we started to burst information across at multiple parts of the, of the laps and this is how it was, was in the late 90s. And then as we came into the mid 2000s we started to fit receivers around the track so we would have real time data. But there is a lesson to be learned here which is uh, you shouldn't wait to rely on perfect information before you start something because there is value to be learned when the, when the data is coming in bursts and then as it improves, then your understanding gets better. 
Real-time data is a very important part of motor racing, uh, and within the context of what we're discussing today, I would suggest that real-time data means current data. There's a lot to be learned from history, but there is nothing like knowing what is happening now to be able to have a clear understanding of what sort of decisions you should be taking. One of the things that digital twins provide us in motor racing, and this may sound a little bit strange, it's not so much always predicting the future, sometimes just understanding what's happening now is, is pretty important as well. To give you an idea of how much data we're talking about, in a, uh, in a Formula One car, there's about 150 sensors on the car measuring things during a race. And it's sending data back to the garage uh, over a microwave telemetry link. And so you're getting about a billion numbers uh, in a two hour race. Sorry? Sorry. So you're getting, oh, suddenly you can hear me. So you're getting about a, a billion numbers over the race, uh, race event of two hours. We also have digital twins operating in the garage, which are turning that into knowledge that people can understand, performance index indices, condition indices, etc. So the amount of virtual data that we get is about three to five times that. And this is another important area where digital twins can help. Sometimes just being able to use the digital twin as a virtual sensing to be able to measure stuff which is not easily measurable either on the car or somewhere else is an important part of the whole process. There are many parts to a racing car. Um, I'm going to trivialize a little bit. Uh, tires and engines are two of the uh, things that wear out quite quickly. Um, having said that, uh, Formula One engine, now uh, there are three engines that you can race throughout the season. And so you not only have to manage the, the performance and life of an engine during a race, you need to think about uh, the next six races that that engine may have to perform. And tyres, uh, they are ultimately where the where the, the car touches the track is where you generate traction, cornering, uh, braking. Uh, the tyres will perform well until they wear out. And when they wear out, you have to decide when to come in to change them for the pit stops. And so when you're in the, the race event, a lot of the use of the digital twin is being able to understand the data that you have and to be able to determine when is the best time to make a change. Interestingly, in, in motor racing, you know, we have this steady stream of real-time data. In a lot of cases, what the real-time data allows you to do is have more time to understand, to orientate the data, to understand the context, to decide at what point you bring the car in to change your tires. So a typical race may have one pit stop. The timing of that pit stop is critical. The other thing which is important is not only using digital twins, using data to understand better what is happening, but to be able to display that information across to the people who need to use it to make the decisions. And part of this is where, where the trust comes in because it's not enough to have analytics that tell you something clever. You need the people who have to decide from it to, to be able to say, yes, that makes sense, I will do it. Now, I'm showing some examples here. The, on the top left-hand corner is just showing lap times for the different cars. So that is, uh, the lap time will be changing. And that gives you your your understanding of yourself and your competition, how well you're doing on the track. And then how you display that data, if you look at the figure below that, the circle, is just showing the, the different cars around the track, showing the spacing between them. And so immediately, anyone looking at that picture will say, okay, I know how long, uh, if I come in for a pit stop, where I will come out next to my competitors. 
And so it's a very clear view that anyone in the garage can look at and understand what's happening at the racetrack. Now, behind that, we are running uh, lots of simulations throughout the weekend, which is saying, well, if I take a pit stop now, what will that do in terms of my points finish? What will that do in terms of chances of winning? And so this is just normal Bayesian analysis, uh, Monte Carlo simulations, which is saying, what is my best bet if I want to make a, a, make a pit stop now? But in front of the people, there is this visualization which is showing them the basis of what goes into the analytics. When we first started using um, Monte Carlo simulation, which is fairly commonly or more commonly used around uh, industry nowadays, it was probably three years, four years before the race engineers and the team principals truly embraced it. And this is a, an example of processes and people need to get familiar with new technology before they will use it and trust it. And what tended to happen was, uh, at first, uh, race engineers would make decisions, and then later they might look at the data and say, well, what would have happened if I'd done that? And they see the result would have been better, so they start leaning on it more. Today, people rely very heavily on what the, the simulations tell them. The other picture I've shown, <coughs> Uh, which is just plotting out the difference in lap time as it changes from lap to lap. A very simple thing to, to show. But what that tells you is I can start looking at the slopes of lines to see how fast my car is compared to another. I can see when the slope starts to get shallower, which tells me my tyres are wearing out. And I can see what happens after I have a pit stop. And so in that simple picture which is just showing lap time as it changes from lap to lap. I get a complete picture of the race as it evolves. And importantly, if I pick up one of these uh, pieces of A4 after a race, I can look at it. I, I could tell you exactly what's happened in the race event. So in, in creating digital twins, also think very much about how you present it. And the right metrics can help. Now, motor racing is a little bit simple or simple, it's easy because everyone understands the metrics of lap time. And so you can talk lap time to anyone and people will understand. It's not always so easy in other industries, although I would suggest that we have, uh, we, we always have a metric of price, which we all understand, um, which is, is good. But coming up with the right metrics is always, is also important. I mentioned at the beginning about risk and change and time. Um, the, the process that we, we, we used in motor racing is very much looking at the risk first. Concentrate on what is important. And in terms of the, the racing cars, it's generally performance and reliability. Safety is also important, but safety is, safety is really table stakes. You need to put a safe car. It's probably worth bearing in mind that a, a Formula One car, which is uh, racing every two weeks, and when it does so, there's some 500 million people watching you as you race, has only got the, the ability to run a maximum of about seven hours on the racetrack during a race weekend. And this is why you need the time to give yourself time, use the digital uh, to give you time to think, to be able to establish new things. Very quickly, uh, can you translate this information, this approach into other industries? The answer is yes. Um, we at Fraser Nash do a lot of work in the energy sector, so I just had some very quick examples here of applications of digital twins in energy. I'm not going to go into any great detail. In nuclear, what we do is we, uh, we recognize the fact that you can only inspect a reactor every year or every two years. So you need to be able to combine structural models and 
probability to be able to make best use of the limited information that you can get when you inspect a reactor, and this is to determine the, the lifing of graphic moderators. In the wind sector, uh, you're putting wi uh, wind turbines into different areas, into different environments, and so being able to establish how they will perform with different uh, wind directions, sea states, etc., requires a level of digital twinning to be able to do that quickly and reliably. In the oil and gas sector, corrosion, uh, like tires, everything eventually wears up. Anything that's made of metal will gradually corrode. Understanding when it becomes a problem is important. And so we underpin that with chemical and uh, physical models of pipework to be able to understand corrosion better. And with gas turbines, like an engine, you have life-limiting components. Being able to use a digital twin to relate what you're interested in at the heart of a turbine into what is readily measurable by the control system, such as temperatures, uh, allows you to make uh, decisions on lifing based on things that you can actually measure. So I'll leave you with my three things. These are the only th things you need to remember from this talk. Understand the risk, uh, be prepared to change, and you want to save time. If you can save wasting time, you will save money. So the big value and the, the reason that Formula One is still using digital twins after 25 years is it saves money, it saves time, and it allows you to perform better. Thank you very much.